Hi everybody. I want to take you on a cycle ride and walk up my favourite glen, which is behind Blair Athol. I'm standing at, currently in the middle of Blair Athol. This is Blair Athol Village Hall, which many of you will know. This is the entrance to Blair Castle. And swinging around, I'm going to go over the bridge here, the bridge of tilt. I'm going to turn left and go to the tilt car park, which many of you will also know. My story starts there. Blair Athol's here. I'm going to cycle up here, bridge of tilt. And that's tough. Falls of tough must be there. Now, if you follow that road on, which is the old traditional road, you'd go from Falls of Tough all the way up to Braemar in that direction. As I say, this story is about Glen Tilt and where I cycle a lot. And I'm standing here just outside Glen Tilt car park. And you can see a couple of cars in there, no doubt locals. And that's where most of you will start from. And Glen Tilt is 16 miles in length and I'm going to cycle today up to Falls of Tarth and tell you the story as we go along. The entrance to the Glen um, is here. In front of us is Wade's Bridge and Wade's Road and we're told that there was a lodge here at one time called Tibby's Lodge named after the gatekeeper Tibby Cameron who died in 1858. It was constructed when Wade's Road was was built in 1728 as the only entrance from Athol to Glen Tilt. It had a gate which used to be padlocked and Tibby's Lodge was pulled down in 1884 and replaced by East Lodge and this I think is East Lodge. I don't actually see a name on it and that's the entrance just opposite Glen Tilt car park. Talking about Glen Tilt, Angeland, you can see my bike just over here on the right. And I'm going to be cycling up here and telling you about the Glen. <coughs> the Glen has changed little except for the number of people that live there, as I mentioned earlier. I've stopped here and just come down, having cycled from there all the way down here. And I've stopped here because it's just a lovely, lovely spot and very typical of Glen Tilt in its lower reaches. There is a bridge here. I don't actually know its name. Um, most of the bridges and places have names associated with people that live there. Tibby's Lodge was an example we saw earlier and, and further up we'll come to another bridge like this called Gilbert's and beyond that another one called Gow's Bridge named after local people. Athol Estates are particularly good at allowing people to responsibly access their land. And as I just pan down and show you a bit of the river. But it wasn't always this way. And in August 1847, a group of six botanists started from Braemar, which is at the far end. Glen Tilt runs through to D side and Braemar, Bolmoral and all of that. And these six botanists walked from Braemar through Glen Tilt collecting flora on the way. They were confronted by a shooting party. As I pan round over the bridge and I'm going to show you the top side, there's my bike, of the river. They were confronted by a shooting party who alleged they were walking on private land and they ordered them to return to Braemar, which they politely refused and continued on down the glen. At Tibby's Lodge, the place where we started from and named after Tibby Cameron, they found the gate was locked and they could not pass without the Duke's permission. The Duke appeared and told them they were trespassing and told them that they could return the, by the way they came, which was clearly impossible, uh, having walked all day long. And so the party then escaped over a wall pursued by the du Duke's familiars, which I presume it means his 
his ten his employees or people who work for the Duke. Isn't that water beautifully clear down there? It's kind of peaty coloured, but you can just so transparent looking at all those rocks. What then happened? The botanists did not leave it there. They took the case to law, to the courts. And th three years later, a decision was made against the Duke that he couldn't restrict people from walking on his land. The Duke wasn't satisfied with that and he took it to the House of Lords. The Duke again lost the decision. And from this incident, the Scottish Rights of Way Society was formed. So what I'm gonna do now is cycle up round here and we'll just stop at one other place which will look at the river and then we'll go to Gilbert's Bridge. And I've stopped here because it's probably one of the best places to let you see the river down below. Um, just panging along, you'll see my bike sitting there as you walk along. Let's just pan back. There's been a fall of trees, which you can see here. And because of that, it's opened up the river down below. And as I said to you before, the first mile or so of Glen Tilt has these very deep gorges with the water and the rocks bared at the bottom. And if you pan on up, we can see the hills up on the side. And that's where the, actual, the rifle range is. There's a Glen Tilt City Club and rifle range. But, and what I'm gonna do now is cycle along to Gilbert's Bridge. The road now just starts to come out onto much more level ground. You can see the hills up behind. And before, we, and we're gonna head up in, over here. And that's the line of Glen Tilt. In front of us, we have a cattle grid. And obviously these are made so that sheep and cattle can't go through here. And so you don't have to open the gate the whole time. To the left is Gilbert's Bridge. Let me just pan round here quickly. So that's the way we're gonna go up. We're gonna go up that road, but let me just stop for a second at Gilbert's Bridge, which is here. And it's, I've always wondered why it was called, or why it is called Gilbert's Bridge. Everyone who lives here knows it as Gilbert, Gilbert's Bridge, and is named after Gil, William Gilbert Stewart, who had a cottage here, and he was a hillman. So obviously somebody who worked up in the hills, I'm guessing for the estate. Let's just have a look at the water down below. You can see how rugged it is. And what I'm gonna do is just pan round quickly over the top of the bike. And again, we can look at the the river down here. You can just see how distinct the, the rock formation is. And down. What I'm gonna do is hide my bike here because I'm gonna go on a wee excursion and you'll join me in a minute. Gilbert's Bridge and panning round here, you do wonder if Gilbert the Hillman lived anyone here, as anywhere near here as a pheasant jumps out in front of us. It's a natural place you'd think for somebody to have a house. And maybe these piles of stones along here were once a house. Anyway, speak to you in a minute when I get to my destination, I want to show you. This is actually the first time I have been here. I've, the road up Glen Tilt actually goes on the opposite side of the Glen. And you can probably just see it through the trees over there. And we may well stop there look at this as well but this is one of the many settlements where people used to live up Glen Tilt but people used to eke out a living here and I believe there were some I need to look at my notes but a couple of thousand people or well, certainly in the hundreds who lived here and this is the remains of their houses and we can just sit and speculate as to what it is. And as we just walk through here, you ask yourself who lived here, who were the people? And I know 
without much doubt at all that the archivist in Atoll Estates can tell you. Over here, a number of years ago, I approached the archivist, I think her name's Jane Anderson, and she did some digging for us. And she was able to tell us who lived here, um, their rent that they paid in the 70, early 1700s, it was in kind and sheep and bulls of barley. But towards the end of the 1700s, I believe money started to come into the payments. And she t was able to tell us who the tenants were, how many were here, etc. And on the other side, what we'll do, we'll, I'll cycle up here and I'll probably stop just around here because there's a story to do with that location as well and the school and no doubt people who lived here, their children would have gone to that school. I just cycled along here. Gilbert's Bridge is literally here and we've just come here, but I just had to stop here because I wanted to show you these rock formations that are here. Rocks, a very big part of the story of Glen Tilt and this section of the rock in particular tells us a lot. Just look at this. There's no silt at the bottom of any of this. Huge slabs going up the side and then down into the bottom. And I suspect all of this is scoured out in the winter rains and when we get all the snow melt that, that takes place. As I said to you, rocks are a very key bit of the dental story. Just look at these big slabs here and further down there as well. Speak to you later. I've just cycled up here and opposite us on the other side, these are the ruins that we were talking about just now. And we're on the road that I pointed out back then. You can see my bike here and this place here is called Och Gobel. Sorry for my Gallic pronunciation, which is non-existent. Which translate as the, translates as the field of the fork. And there was a 42 acre farm here where cro crops were grown. John Kerr's book, which I rely on very heavily um, and I wrote, recommend it and I'll put a reference at the bottom um, in the text. Um, it tells us that in 1776, the school was opened under Duncan Ferguson here. And he taught 40 boys and 13 girls, a total of 53 pupils. 10 years later, um, after opening the school, the, ro the school roll dropped from 53 to 44. And the school was closed as there were insufficient numbers at the school. Incredible, isn't it, if you think of that? So a little school. And again, up here, there's a settlements up there. So there would have been settlements all around here. I'm going to cycle on from here and we'll stop further up the glen. I just cycled up along this road. There are a couple of black-faced sheep that did so much to change the highlands because they were much more profitable from hundreds and thousands of people trying to eke out their living from the glen. But I wanted to stop here because when I cycle through Glen Tilt, I always admire this rock formation. You just look at it and how it's pushed up at angles. You can see it all lying at angles. Up. Just spectacular. Just a little entrance here where the water has worn its way through. The next place we're going to stop at is a place called Marble Lodge and it's just around the corner up here. I've just cycled up here and this is a spot I often stop at when I cycle. I'm just going to pan round and I'm going to show you a couple of things. Up here you can see some remains of human, I don't know whether they were settlements or whether they were where the sheep were held. Down the bottom is Marble Lodge and I'll talk about that in a minute. But And then what we're going to do is we're going to head off up round here, round the glen uh, to Forest Lodge. I've just cycled down to 
Marble Lodge. Marble Lodge was built in 1815 and John Kerr's book tells me it was a, built as a shooting lodge but I find that quite surprising because it's such a small lodge um, and it's nearby a quarry, a marble quarry which we'll talk about a bit more later. Um, and then further up here if I cross over this cattle grid or sheep grid as it would be here along let's see if we can find where the marble is so just look over the edge here let's just see if we can see any marble down here there are strips of marble in the river just down here you can see a seam of marble going across the river and number one just here and there's another one just there I'm walking now up to Gow's Bridge and there is a lady who asked me to have a look and see and show her Gow's Bridge. Well, as we come round this corner, we'll see Gow's Bridge. It kind of gives you some idea of the bridge. And on the east bank of the bridge, there's a track and the track leads up to Marble Quarry, which is up here. Thought you might enjoy seeing this person wondering what on earth we're up to. Down the bottom there's Marble Lodge. Just here is Gow's Bridge. And on the opposite side, there's a track. John Kerr's book tells me led up to Marble Quarry. And it tells us the quarry was on the east bank of the river and in the 1820s was described as containing an immense blocks of marble varying from grass green into yellowish cast intermixed with gray and up to eight men worked in the quarry and a weekly output of four blocks blocks were boxed and transported down to Dunkeld the marble was cut and polished and unfortunately, due to the quality of the marble, the quarry was not sustainable. There were cheaper imports arriving by the 1830s. I'm guessing it would have been up here somewhere because you can see the track running along. I'm going to now head on up this path here, up to the top, and I get a lovely view of the glen. I'm just stopping here, because again, this is another special spot. Down the bottom here was Gars Bridge, marble lodge around the side. And that track that was coming up to the marble quarry was coming up here and I'm not sure if that was to do with the quarry but if you go up again you can see the track running along here and I don't know what that track's for or why it was there whether it was also to do with marble I just love this spot often I'll come and rest my bike and just take in this scenery and as I say in the winter months also in the late evenings in the summer, you'll often see herds of deer. And I'm gonna cycle on round and round here. I'm just gonna pan round slowly and we're gonna see another settlement over here on the hills. I wonder who lived there. You can see the end of his cable house. I'm going to pan round here to Clach Glass, which means gray stone. And it was here that probably one of the most famous people of Blair Athol and Glen Tilt lived, a guy called Donald Macbeth. He's, you'll see him as you come into Blair Athol, you'll see he's the Highlander that welcomes you to Blair Athol. And this is where his family lived. And you can imagine this, he was a marksman. He served in the crime era. He was decorated in the Crimea. And in 1861, Queen Victoria identified him as a man of great presence with an immense war record, having served in the Crimea with distinction. He became Sergeant Major of the Athol Highlanders. And so a lovely part of the world to live in if you are here today not i suspect if you're trying to eke out a living but i'm sure 
many of these hardy highlanders did we've traveled about eight miles up Glen tilt and we've come round there and along here in this road to the side and i'm going to swing around and you can just see the sides of the glen now are really sheer and steep quite a lot of rock on them and i just want to stop here yes we've got that wind but i just wanted to stop and show you forest lodge and that's forest lodge it was built as a shooting lodge in 1789 the river's down on our left here and we've just cycled up here forest lodge is around the corner and this spot i'm coming to now is a very special place it resulted in what is known as modern geology because of the rock formation in front of us is called Dal and S Bridge. And Dal and S Bridge, the bridge is no longer here. In 1785, a man called Hutton came and visited this spot. And he is known as the father of modern geology. Geology at that time was followed a theory called Neptunism, which stated that the rocks of the world precipitated out of a vast ocean. Hutton just didn't believe this was right. And so he came here and he said the granite is here found breaking and displacing the strata in every conceivable manner, including the fragments of broken strata interjected at every possible direction which appear. I just want to show you a, a picture a watercolor that was painted and given to me by my friend John Cameron, the late John Cameron, who was very much the father of Blair Athol in modern times. And I you just see this wind again, but this is the waterfall that was painted here to reflect the bridge that is here, and you can just see the remains of the bridge here. In giving me the picture, John said, we spoke about the meeting of the white and pink rock of Glen Tilt beside a fallen bridge shown on the TV program, Man of Rock. And Man of Rock was all about Hutton and, and Scottish Enlightenment in the 18th and 19th century. The watercolor, John tells me, came from Donald McBeath's house. And we just passed Donald McBeath's house. It shows the bridge and two big stones where the two rocks met. When my grandfather was a farmer on Athol, John said, he dropped a stone from the bridge and killed a large salmon below. Well, I've just had my lunch and there's my bike and I'm gonna cycle along the road up around, you can just see the road there, around the glen to Falls of Tuff. It's quite a long way still. We've cycled from down here. You can see the sunlight is down right down the far end. We seem to have come into the dark side in all the shadow. This is the road coming up and on to the right. This this little side glen was part of what caught my eye. And I'm gonna just zoom in to the top of it. And that, you know, I just thought that looked lovely up there. This is where we're going. We're gonna go right up here and it's still a long way to go. I've stopped here because I think this is the last time you'll be able to look all the way down the glen. And those trees down there, <coughs> around there is where we talked about Hutton, father of modern geology and the waterfall. The hill that you see on the, out on the skyline there, I believe that's Shehalian. I don't know if the camera is quite good enough, but there's a little bit of snow to the right of it on the top, just sort of stop and show you where I am. It's cycled a bit further on. This is where I've we've come from right down there. I'm gonna, there's high glens either side. I'm just gonna follow the river that's down below us. And I'm gonna show you where we're heading off to. And as I say, there's very steep side of glen on both sides here and we'll pan round 
and you can see my bike and we're going to head off down this track along here Fulza Taff further on round to the left I've stopped and just walked up here to a shielding or a waterfall called Rud Alt Akkordae or shielding of the hanging burn as we know it is in English the shielding is a, a place where people would have used as a summer dwelling place when they bought their cattle I'll show you that in a bit a little bit more later in, so let me do I'm gonna just pan around so this is I think is the, the spot you can see it's a lovely glade and we're gonna just pan around if the camera will follow me and I think the shielding or the dwelling house was probably just down here in this sheltered spot and you can see the glen all the way around us also connected with this spot Queen Victoria who came here in 1844 and said to have had this spectacular view as she watched Prince Albert and a shooting party it's actually quite hidden and I am going to make my way up just to this knoll here as I suspect we'll get a much better view I don't know if I'll leave this camera on okay I'll see what happens as we make our way down see how deep it is down there hmm that's gonna make me think twice I don't fancy falling down that anyway that's the hanging burn and you can see why it's called the hanging burn it's a lovely spot and you can see the road heading up to the Falls of Tarf Dal Fienach or Shaggy Ho, which I think is this area over here. It said in 1716 John McIntosh lived here and he had a farm of 20 acres and I think it must have been around this area. In 1564 Mary Queen of Scots visited Persia as a guest of the Earl of Athol. It is said that the Earl organised a hunt for her and the account is given of this by uh, Professor Barclay who was one of the Queen's party. Professor Barclay tells of this 1564 hunt. So you're, you're talking about 450 odd years ago. It's a long time if you think about it. Anyway, Professor Barclay tells us 2000 Highlanders or wild Scotch, as you call them here, were employed to drive the hunting ground of all deer from the woods and hills of Athol, Badenoch, Murray and the counties about. As these Highlanders used a light dress and a very swift of foot, they went up and down so nimbly that in less than two months they brought together 2,000 red deer besides rose and fallow. They were killed that day, 360 deer with fibrils, I'm not quite sure what a fibril is, and some rose. And I suspect that this spot here is where it took, took place because I just think it's such a lovely spot, so remote, very few people come up here. We'll go on round here in the Falls of Tarfa around that corner. And there's been a massive rock fall off this face here. Um, you can see all the fresh rock down there. I suspect what happens is that the water gets behind the rock and then it freezes and inch it by inch it prizes the rock away and that looks pretty fresh to me. I was going to talk to you about these trees as well. If you look along the top there you can see a few trees and you then say why are they there and not farther down the glen? <clears throat> all this bit here. Why aren't there trees here? Well the answer is in front of us. If you look at these white dots, they're sheep and the sheep graze all the vegetation all <clears throat> along with the excessive deer numbers that we have 
here the red deer are in huge numbers my own personal view would be nice if you introduced the wolf but our farmers are not very friendly towards our wildlife here in Persia with they hate the beaver and they're out there exterminating them at every opportunity it's great shame on Scotland if we had tigers here they'd be shooting them too or if they were elephants no doubt they would be justifying that too anyway we're gonna cycle along here falls are tough is just around that corner there I've just cycled along here and this is the end of the road so I'm gonna walk now to the falls are tough and I'm just gonna pan round and just show you the scenery and down below us here is the river I'm leaving my bike here and it's a path from now on and I'll talk to you for a bit you can feel this wind which is accompanying us and I hope it'll blow me back to Blair Athol and home again to Killycrankie where I live but uh, the little rivulets on the on the way like here and I'm very pleased I didn't bring my bike or attempt to cycle this bit of the path as you can see it's nigh on impossible you can see how worn the path is can't you and you can see bike tracks as well we're coming to the falls of Taft now we can see the bridge and I'll walk a little bit further on and you can see the, the pass through which it comes from here down and there's a waterfall if I remember correctly down the bottom there. In 1770 a single arch stone bridge was built over the Taft by a stonemason John Stewart. I'm not sure if we can see any of that but we'll look at it when we go down and see bridge was removed in 1819 the Scottish rights away incident was 1849 that's 30 years after the bridge had been removed and in 1861 Queen Victoria Prince Albert the seventh the sixth Duke of Athol forded the Taff here on their way back to Balmoral after staying with the Duke in Queen Victoria's diary she wrote a very few moments brought us to the celebrated ford of Toff, which is very deep and after heavy rain almost impossible. Sandy Makara, the guide and, and two pipers went first all the time. And there's a well-known picture of the Queen riding her horse through the river here, flanked either side by two strong Highlanders in case she should fall in, God forbid, and all that. And Piper's playing, incredible. I wonder how far the Pipers would have played. I'm sure they would have walked while the nobility were on their horses. In August 1879, which is, what is that? That's 60 years after the bridge reduced, two English students crossed the river while in spate one lost his life in, and in 1886 seven years later the Bedford Bridge was built and named in memory of the man who lost his life and it's just magic absolutely magic What a beautiful spot this is. As I say, I'm absolutely honored, privileged, lucky, whatever, to live in this part of Scotland. I'm gonna swing round, and maybe what I'll do is I'll keep walking, and we'll just walk down the other side of the bridge. I see there's a plaque here, so let's just have a look at this plaque and see what it says says the bridge was erected in 1886 with funds donated by the, by his friends and others the Scottish Rights Away Society 
Limited to commemorate the death of Francis John Bedford, aged 18, who was drowned near here on the 25th of August, 1879. Yeah, well, I bet you he didn't expect this. But what a lovely part of Scotland, isn't it? Just, as I just walk down here, I'm gonna go down to the river and that'll be the end of our walk up Falls Tough. I'll cycle all the way back home. And thank you for staying with me, for those of you who've survived the ordeal. And no doubt I'll do another one or another area some other time to tell you a bit more about this wonderful part of Scotland in Perthshire and the highlands of Perthshire that we live in. Isn't that wonderful? Wow! Incredible.